my aunt once said to me, a company and stick with it. <laughs> and I felt that was like the clearest statement of what I didn't want to do. And I'm very aware right now that I don't want to do that to this particular situation. I don't want to say, this is where I am. I'm living in Monroe, Maine, and my life is such intense. I'm a potter, I'm a mother, I'm a gardener. If something comes along, well, I wouldn't be interested in it because what I'm in, in is so good. I feel that the most disrespectful thing that you can do towards something that you care about, whether it's a lifestyle or a place, is to institutionalize it, to um, fix a form for it in your mind, and then demand that it follow that form and to put energy into that. For me, freedom to evolve is the most important thing there is. I think a lot of me was very influenced by the talk about the moving to the country, the image of moving to the country. While we were in Cambridge, we spent a lot of time sitting around with friends fantasizing about buying a square mile of land and um, organizing a town which would run along enlightened lines. We were living in Cambridge and I was getting a master's degree in, in writing for the Boston Globe and Squidge was a social worker with a division of child guardianship in Boston. We would both lived in the world of, you know, trying to make it financially and we'd both been pretty good at it. Before I moved up here, I had a lot of free time and I used to spend a lot of it lying down, looking up at the ceiling and visualizing on the ceiling this farm that we were going to buy in Maine. And it was a very, very visual, physical, almost real thing, that farm up on the ceiling. And then we moved here and that whole picture on the ceiling vanished completely. I, I once wrote about it as blowing on a dandelion in the fall and it just phew, silently, peacefully just blew away. And we were faced immediately with some, you know, very pressing kind of realities. I was born in Connecticut to a, uh, you know, a fairly well-to-do family. And, you know, I never pounded a nail in anger in my life, you know, before I moved here. And I'd never, you know, seen a chainsaw, much less used one before. Being here requires a hell of a lot of work. I mean, living here is not... It's not an easy uh, way to live. It's not like work is a job, you know, that you get your money from and then you go off and spend your money. I mean, it's your heat, it's your food. It, you know, the work here is very much more uh, personal. The, the rhythm of it is, it is intensely personal and the rewards of it are very personal too. Here, here it is in May and this is about a, a sixth or an eighth of the amount of wood that we'll use this winter time. But it's nice to have it stacked up in May and uh, checking and drying so it'll be ready for winter. It makes you feel good to be able to, you know, to live with the seasons like that. It makes you feel good physically. It makes you feel good mentally. And, and I like it. I like that a lot. There was so much that we didn't know. And I think um, when you're insecure about something, you do a lot of comparing yourself to other people. So. Um, in the image of homesteading, we wanted to get everything in just early and do it just right. Thank you. <laughs> That's real good, Meadow. When we first moved to Maine, I was very dogmatic about homesteading. I felt that I had to make all my own bread and go to many craft fairs. And I just, I exhausted myself. And little by little, I remembered that we had moved to Maine in order to be free to exercise choice and that by being so rigid about the stereotypes of country living I was limiting very much the scope of my life. Good. Okay. Okay. Do, you want, do you want to pour the next one or do you want me to do that? I will. Okay. But you help me. We're ready for it. Okay. This is the first house that we looked at and it was well below zero outside, and it was 80 degrees inside, and that impressed me a lot. You, you, it, it just requires a great deal of competence in a variety of areas to be able to, to live here, unless you're rich. 
and there's no rich people that I know of, you know, that live in Monroe. So, so people are confident, and that confidence is built on uh, economic necessity. We moved to Maine with um, another couple, and when we thought about moving here, the how we were going to make our living was very important. We wanted to move here because we wanted to have an independent lifestyle. We didn't want to work for anybody else, and the other couple and I both worked full-time as potters. For the first year, that was our sole source of income. Since then, uh, Jay has developed a profession which he would not have had the opportunity to do. And while he was doing that, we were earning all our money from pottery. It gives him the chance to have his freedom to explore what he wants to do, to stop what he's doing, to reevaluate it, to go to something else. And that his doing, his work, also allows me that freedom to stop and, and change. As a person who is involved in the uh, political processes of Monroe, I look at change in a very different way than I do as, a, as an individual. The 1980 census will show an increase for the first time since 1860. Those people have come here uh, and mostly bought up abandoned places, uh, have had you know, very little effect on the uh, look and, and feel of the town. We did have a few years ago quite a few of the elder people that had to have help to finance their establishment and pay their taxes with the state. And the younger group moving in town, or the newer group, has eliminated quite a lot of that because they were able to finance uh, their own problems and pay their taxes on their own. Well, they brought in a lot of new ideas that, that we didn't have before. Some of them a little wild, but uh, I think we need uh, something like that. Uh, after you sit around so long on the old hill, uh, you get a little bit set in your ways. Well, yes, I've changed my attitude quite a lot because uh, most people are moving in are very well educated people. Many have degrees and some are specialists in certain lines. Uh, previous to this influx, it was uh, not a one-man town, but I had uh, various duties I don't have to do now. Those in favor of the motion to accept the directions will signify, please. Those opposed? The vote. The area where we were living at the time was in a state of change, and it had been a very rural area, really quite a bit like this. The, uh, a lot of the farmers were selling out. The taxes were going higher. I mean, it got to the point where we would go into the store and, you know, you wouldn't see anyone you knew. And, and this, you know, after living in a place for so many years is, is really quite a change. I mean, we, we knew something was wrong. I think we felt uncomfortable with our life down there, but I would never have pinpointed what it was. It's hard to make a living up here, that's for sure, when you're used to making, you know, family good money down there, especially when you have such a large family. <laughs> it's even, you know, harder. For Charlie especially, the, the burden of responsibility in, in trying to see that his children were cared for. And uh, I think really this is probably the hardest part of coming here was, was right. the burden on him. Yeah. We didn't really foresee a lot of the problems that we encountered here. And uh, we lost everything. I mean, we lost our insurance. We, we lost a great deal, really. The kids didn't go to the dentist for a long time. And I think that was one of the biggest concerns that we had. I know it was for Charlie. Well, there aren't too many people that live in Monroe that are my age, but I've got quite a few people that I know now. Just kind of took a while to get used to living out here. There are a lot of things that we've never done before. Like, I hadn't done too much of making bread. I don't know. Kind of enjoy it quite a bit now. Okay, it's ready to knead. My, my parents have noticed a big change in the children, and I think it's made the children uh, much more self-sufficient than they ever were. Uh, we didn't come here consciously intending to really come back to the land and, and do that kind of thing. It's been more that we've really had to do it, and we've enjoyed doing it.
we had we were cutting we had like three cords of wood we were gonna sell down a Wallow railroad but by the time we got all done the railroads closed down so we just used all that wood for the winter we're planning on selling it do a lot of hang in the summer uh, do some beaning for our fences help them do a lot of beaning pretty good summer I guess do a lot of swimming that's about all, I guess. Take speed. How many eggs did you get? Twenty. Twenty? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in many ways, coming here has, has challenged us, uh, I think, to be stronger and more resourceful. Uh, y you really are dependent on yourself, and I think this is one reason why we enjoy being here so much, because you are more in control of your life. You're, you're kind of forced to be. I want no man at any time alone. I, as we get out of those trucks, I want fixed bayonets as we dismount. The idea spawned in the late 60s, 68, 69, when there was so much unrest, most of it due to the, to the Vietnam War. And uh, it was right after a lot of the cities had been on fire. I was sitting there watching TV, watching Philadelphia, which was 30 miles away in flames. It certainly was a shock. Not only people you're watching on the screen getting their heads kicked in in the streets, but your own friends getting their heads kicked in in marches. And I was heavy into uh, to writing at the time, and I had a lot of manuscripts coming in and out. And after a while, we found that just about all our mail was being opened. Our phone was tapped. We were really uptight all during the, you know, that whole thing was just like a, We've got to get out. We've got to get out. And at that time, a, a little magazine appeared on the bookshelf, the Mother Earth News. It just really clicked with us, and we we really wanted to, to to get a piece of land somewhere and start to work it and maybe build our own house. We were looking for a, a new life, a different type of a, a lifestyle. And we started doing that down in New Jersey, but it wasn't a, a complete thing because we wanted to use a wood stove get our own firewood, build our own house, have our own garden, and we couldn't do that um, living in the city. We had no money. We came up here with $500, and everything we owned was in the truck. It was on a Sunday, and it was in April. We had left New Jersey, <laughs> we're buying asparagus. The flowers were out, the leaves were out, everything. We walked up here, it was wintertime. I loved it. Oh, I just couldn't believe I was here. It was like Wonderland, you know. I finally arrived here, <laughs> and this was it, you know. The very first person we met was a farmer. He was so friendly, you know, and everybody was so friendly. They'd wave. They'd talk to you in the store. I mean, you know, you just don't get that in the city. Town meetings are fun. <laughs> you know, you go to town meetings and there's everybody you know, you know, and, and so, oh, you know, you haven't seen them for a year, but it's just like you saw them yesterday. So it's, it's just like a big family up here, I think. I, I, I really do. We never grew a tomato, never grew a plant. I never even built a doghouse before. And everybody said, oh, you can't do that. So you can't build a house. You've never built a house before. Now there, in, in the middle of the clearing out in the woods at the end of a really nice road that we built, is this really fine house. And because you were there when every peg was pounded, when every log was laid, where every stone was put, you know how sound and how strong it is. And you know that you'll be able to very soon now pull up your blankets around yourself to keep yourself warm. I, f I feel that uh, moving to Maine and doing with what you have at hand, using the, the, the materials that come from the woods and simple hand tools, maybe a few simple ma machines, that you are able to build not only a life for yourself, but you're, you're, you're able to, to utilize those things around you in a, in a way that doesn't rob other people of energy. We live on less than $2,000 a year. Uh, part of that reason is because we don't want to pay taxes. So we just make sure we don't make over the amount allowed. We started at the beginning so that we wouldn't have to support a war effort. 
we, we draw all our insurance from God. We look to him for all our guidance and all our protection. I was an atheist when I came up here, but I really found God. He really saw me through. I could not have done near anything I, I did without the reassurance of uh, God. If there were a serious medical problem of any sort, I would definitely turn to God for my healing, or for anybody in my family, because that's what I believe would do it. I don't believe anything else would do it. I think that this whole experience is, is going to influence the children's lives um, because it gives them a sense of um, fulfillment. It's a satisfying way of life, I feel it is, and I feel it is for any child who lives with wood smoke, uh, felling trees, peeling logs, building your own house. I think that's quite an experience for a child anyway. I think they'll always want to come back to, to this way of life. They certainly see that putting on a pair of uh, store-bought jeans is a lot easier than sitting down trying to knock out a pair of your own. They know that uh, turning on an electric stove is a lot easier mm -hmm. than feeding a, a wood one, where we think it's a, just another joy. They see it, at least uh, they're getting a hint, that it's a lot easier to turn on an electric stove than it is to feed a wood one. For my part, anyway, I, I, I see them wanting to experiment there's little smells and sounds of the woods and of basic living will haunt them, I think. And it will maybe not draw them to this, this type of lifestyle, but will certainly flavor their life. For the first year we were here, I didn't really miss the fact that there weren't that many people around because we were so busy getting everything together and had a huge, huge garden that kept me busy and so forth. And and I had to try out not using too much electricity and burning a wood flyer. <laughs> and it really kept us busy. Sometimes we'd have friends come up from the city and they'd say, is that all you do is work? You're canning all this food and you're growing all this and don't you ever sit down and read a book? And I said, gee, I don't have time. <laughs> I'm not taking the time for the things that I really used to enjoy. And so that's where I, I feel I am now. Like I want more time for some of the things that I really love that don't have anything to do with homesteading or survival or being independent and doing everything for myself, you know. I thought last fall about quitting farming altogether. We had absolutely no idea about anything, soil or machinery or anything. So treat this as an experience, as a, as a teaching experience, a learning experience. Living rurally has really um, got us involved in so many different projects, probably too many projects. Um, Originally, we just had to try animals, and not just one type of animal, but sheep and cows and chickens and bees. <laughs> and really, we bit off more than we could chew. Um, we had trouble with the first cow that we got. Um, we didn't do things right, and we lost her. And I think now, having been up here three years, we, we realized that, that each thing we get involved in, it, there's a lot to it, and you really have to concentrate more have less variety going on. Almost everybody says that uh, to be a success as a farm, it depends as much on the farmer's wife as it does on anything else. One of the drawbacks to it for, for me is that it divides you on a role basis. It, it almost polarizes you as a man and a woman. I was doing all the women's, traditional women's work, whereas I couldn't do the heavy carrying of, you know, wood, and I couldn't work sawing the wood, and I couldn't do the mechanical work. So that <clears throat> I ended up doing women's work, which is fine, because I think women are going to have to do, always do a certain amount of women's work. But I had hoped that Bob and I would, like, do more things together coming up to the country, you know. Because when you visit the country, we camp together and we canoe together. <laughs> If I didn't have an in outside income, I could, I'd could i never be farming, not the way I'm farming now. I used to have a regular 40-hour a week, 50-week-a-year job, and uh, as I considered it, I realized that two weeks off is only 4% of your time, and that means 96% of my time was spoken for by my employer, and I, I thought that was too much. I would have rather had maybe 50-50 or, or something like that. So I got more interested in uh, independent type of work, and I, I managed to buy some real estate, borrowed the money, and 
fixed up the, the buildings and gradually over a period of about five years got so that I was more or less uh, independently empl employed. I had heard of people who were independently wealthy, everyone's heard of that, and I, I sort of thought I'd be satisfied with it just being independently poor. If we give up farming, uh, I think I'll miss it. I really liked farming. I fell right into it backwards. I mean, I had absolutely no idea at all that I'd ever be a farmer. If anyone had ever asked me, I would, that would have been the last thing on my list. But I really like planting that. You go up there and you get that field all ready, and uh, you plant it, and then you go up every day and you watch, and a whole field comes up. It's just incredible. And the whole field just has a very faintly green look, and you look, and it's just through the ground. And, the whole thing develops and you cultivate it, get the weeds down. And I really got into doing that. Daddy! Daddy! Here it comes. There's a boy. That's right. We weren't plowing, we were spreading. I'd like to be in a less rural situation where there's more people around to learn from and, and be around and same, you know, where our children can have more opportunities as far as being with other children and people on a more regular basis, where there's more culturally happening. The reason we happened to end up in Monroe was because this place was for sale. What the group started out to look for was a situation that had enough land so that we would not, in the end, be living communally, but rather as a community, as a planned community, with our own homes on the land, sharing the land in common. Well, this is How many times have you seen water tonight? Damn over here. When the group split up, and uh, it didn't happen all at once, it happened over, oh, uh, well, over a year, I guess. Uh, we found ourselves in a great deal of debt. We were about $3,000 behind. And uh, the basic problem aggravated of, well, the basic problem of uh, misunderstanding of controlling your finances uh, just aggravated all the group's problems. It became very clear quite soon that uh, some of us were bound and determined to stay and make it work, and no matter what, and others were really just not cut out for what we had started out to do. So in the end, um, Alec and the girls and I are here trying to accomplish what we started out to accomplish as a larger group. Come on, Jeremy. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Let's go see the pigs. You know, I certainly wouldn't have ever envisioned myself having animals and introducing someone to my prize, whatever, it turns out to be pigs. Well, a funny thing happened. I went home to see uh, my friends and my family, and uh, I called up a friend of mine, and uh, I was telling him about the place and all, and I couldn't bring myself to tell him that uh, I had pigs. <laughs> so I said, uh, we've got some livestock. <laughs> And uh, he said, livestock, what's that? <laughs> Most people either say they have horses or cows. What do you got? <laughs> so I was caught. I told him. So he said, pigs. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, they're a real treat. If they weren't a treat, I wouldn't keep them. Our biggest problem really is finding, is deciding how to spend the time that we have at home. Uh, you know, figuring out, sometimes we disagree about which things ought to come first. And we all have to, have to realize that there are some things that absolutely essentially must get done and then we, we plan from there about each guy's number one and try to take them all into consideration at some point. I think one of the important things that makes our life different is uh, the way we live has a real important effect on the way the family understands the things that make up our existence, how the pigs uh, provide meat for us and how the garden provides food and how much energy goes into providing those things. And we all have to work together when we work on those kinds of things. A couple of years ago, I probably wouldn't even have tried something like this. I would have just uh, 
let a mechanic do it. But living here has made me learn how to do things like this. And uh, well, I don't especially like it, but uh, being able to do it makes me understand, you know, how things are put together and. Well, it gives me some confidence because I, I know that I can overcome something that I don't like just by using my head. If anybody had told me that three years ago I was going to end up being a nurse, I would have laughed around the state. Being in nursing school was not something that I had in mind when we came up here. I worked at the chain factory for not quite a year and a half. Uh, more than long enough to uh, lose part of the use of this finger and my elbow. People who work down there for any length of time at all are so tired and in pain so much of the time that they don't get a fair shake as far as medicine goes. I think it really is very important that the state and the factory owners do something about making good medical care available to the factory workers at the factory because after you stood on your feet for 10 hours in one place or even eight you don't feel much like going and sitting in a doctor's office for another two or three i came to nursing school in order to have the have the background with which to uh, hopefully start getting people interested in, in bringing real medicine into the factory. Even after I finish school, I'm not going to have certainly enough expertise to, to do all of it, but I would love to be part of it, and I would love to be part of getting it going. I feel as though uh, well, we could live on a whole lot less money if, if we didn't uh, owe the title of the property to the bank, if uh, we weren't dependent on a mortgage then, uh, well, I wouldn't have to work out half so much. You know, you could work uh, in a schedule that uh, didn't mean working for somebody else 40 hours a week. You know, if any of us who've lived in the country and, and lived the way we have, trying to maintain ourselves pretty well ever we're in a position to have to move back to the city the things that we've gained are terribly important and really basic kinds of things our knowledge of ourselves i think has grown tremendously our knowledge of of how things work of uh, of what your your own limits are of what other people's limits may be you know the sort of surprising things that you can and can't do and you you take that with you to the city, your inner resources that you can fall back on, that what gets you through cabin fever season isn't, you know, some of it's hard work, but some of it's being able to be alone and be cold and um, have things inside of you that make you be able to stand it. So that what you gain from being out here and living this way is, uh, well, can't really. <laughs> It's hard to say. It's very important, though.